2803 colon colon uh, etc. And what happened uh, ever since? So let's let's do the following. Let's go back to the router and uh, um, as long as you haven't turned your machine off, even if you hibernate it, you, you should continue to, to have the same uh, uh, username. You shouldn't, uh, there's no need for you to log in again. Just go to the map, click on the router, and you have access to it. So we are going to execute the same command that we had earlier. This is a deadly trap. We're going to execute the same command that we had earlier to see the state of the prefix that we had been working with. Remember that we had done the trace. We had a number of hops, and at a certain time, we uh, had some sort of attack so that the path uh, of uh, the information would change and it would be sent uh, somewhere else. If now we look at the validation of the BGP, <coughs> Uh, the, st the status of the state of the prefix. Remember that it was 2803, 2019, 10, uh, 8,000, uh, colon, colon, uh, etc. And look now at the AS path. First question, what is the autonomous system that is now originating the prefix? Sixty five oh oh two and in and before that what was it? Sixty four one three five, right? So now it's one uh, sixty four one three five, that's the row that was created with the valid state and now look at the validation, the RPKI validation state. Invalid. Not not valid invalid, yes. What does this mean? ASN, uh, yes, ASN 65002 is not, does not have the authority on uh, that prefix. It's not the one that created the ROA. There are no ROAs authorizing that prefix to be published by that AS. So it's identified as invalid. Well, now let me just mention that I had to do the dirty job. Does anybody realize or does anybody have any idea of what sort of attack uh, was uh, uh, done? A hijack, yes, a road hijack, precisely. What Sylvia did is she. Uh, if uh, she's Mexican, she will hijack. Yes, Sylvia, always. What Sylvia did, it's, it's an autonomous system. She's in group two, 65002. She generated a publication of that prefix as uh, the publication that Sylvia generated is more specific Uh, the publication that uh, that prefix covered. You remember, if we did when we did three, we said uh, that was not uh, assigned to any devices. It's part of a network that is being published in the internet uh, through the uh, Laknaga 
uh, that um, it, it has the correct uh, Roe, ROA with it has a valid state, but Sylvia assigned that prefix to an interface in her router and she published and she generated the BGP publication. So what's the mask in IPv6? What, does, what is the mask of that prefix? You get a free uh, beer at the cocktail. Well, they're all free. One or two. So what's the mask it has? A slash? The original had 34. The two of them are correct. I was thinking of the first when the second reaffirmed it, so everything you said was absolutely perfect. Do you think he deserves one of these prices? We have a price. It was more than just a, an, a, a free beer at the cocktail. Now, unfortunately, he answered first. So, well, we have two more. There are going to be two more questions. Uh, each, uh, in, the questions are going to be increasingly difficult. So the original, as you said, uh, was a slash uh, uh, 64 against, uh, it beats the other one because of its specificity and it's in the BGP table with a valid path and as it originated, so we are validating our PKI and it is validated by a non-authorized autonomous system, it's invalid, that's a state. And here we're going to mention something that somebody mentioned, I don't remember who it was, I don't know whether that person is here, but somebody asked me at the coffee break. If I do this, everything you did uh, here, if I do it in my network, in real life, I install an RPKI validator, connect my router, and then um, I see it uh, a new column with uh, the validation state. If all the ones that are valid, I start to rule them out and I start filtering things, the answer is absolutely not. The fact of connecting the router to an RPKI validator, the only thing that it will do is that now the router will add information in the BGP table indicating the validation state of each prefix, but it won't do anything else with that information. It won't filter anything. For the router to start filtering, you need to wish to configure filters on purpose. So that's not a good idea to install an RPKI validator and connecting uh, the validators to have the validation uh, information in the BGP table. That's an excellent idea because when you have a problem, then for all the routes in my BGP table, now I can see the state. So if I have a problem with a r route, I think that it's going somewhere where it shouldn't. And I look at it and it's invalid and it used to be valid. Well, I notice that they're hijacking the route. So it's very useful information to solve problems and it's only for information purposes, only that. So there you put a filter. So what are we going to do now? Well, what we are going to do is precisely we are going to configure a filter because we want, we are going to do something with that. We are going to configure a filter, BGP filter, based on the validation state that basically will try to eliminate all the invalid prefixes. If I eliminate the invalid prefixes and I have some valid left, even though less specific. Because if I eliminate the invalid one and I have one more specific that is valid, I'm going to correct the problem. So that's what we're going to try to do now with the next configuration. Okay. So, vamos a configurar el filter. So we're going to configure the BGP filter based on the validation status. And although we're going to access our BGP process, allow me to share this first.
Can you see it? We enter configuration mode, BGP process. And we have the filter here in the IPv6 family. We apply the filter here. And now we will show you how the prefix looks like. We'll show VGP in unicast and the segment of this IP that was hijacked. Once again, it appears as invalid. I'm going to show this over here, and we'll explain why. It's OK if it doesn't work for Sylvia. It's not that she did anything wrong, but Sylvia is doing the route hijacking. So it's a, it, it, it won't change anything. It configures an RPKI filter. I'm going to do it in my device, and you're going to do it in yours. And there it is. I applied the filter and executed that command. You can copy and paste the filter, but we have router, VGP, etc., etc. Change the XX for your autonomous system. I did VGP once again, and it was invalid. And look at this here. What is your autonomous system that is <coughs> generating the filter, the uh, the prefix after I generate, apply the filter? It's the original, 64135, and the status, once again, is valid. Because it's generating the autonomous system authorized by the ROA. So if we look at the configuration, at the router configuration, we put show run and the filter we apply the VGP is applied to the roadmap it, the roadmap is called RPKI what does the RPKI roadmap do the roadmap RPKI does two things it matches they have roadmap map permit 10 roadmap RPKI permit 10 at the top match RPKI valid, set local preference 200. So how do you read this? This can you be read as, fol is read as follows. The roadmap RPKI will first try to match the valid prefixes. It will go through the BGP table to see all the received prefixes, not the BGP table, but all the prefix received prior to putting them into the BGP table. Each prefix received from the peer through a BGP message, it checks then the validation status. If it's valid, if the validation status is valid, it then matches that permit 10. That is the first entry in the route map. So if it's valid, it sets local preference 200. Then the received prefix is as not found. It sets local preference 100, and that's the end of the route map. So what happens with the received prefixes that are invalid? 
do they match it the permit 10 no because they're not valid the permit 20 no because they're not found so if, if this is not matched by the roadmap what happens these are discarded so this happens always that's how the roadmaps perform so what does this roadmap roadmap do it discards the invalid prefixes the unknown prefixes are named preference 100 and the, for the valid ones this local preference is increased to 200 so the local preference 100 is the default local preference so that is a reason why this prefix over here that was being published by Sylvia is more specific than the original one and because the status is invalid and it doesn't match any of the options or the lines of the route map this is then discarded so it ends up being installed in the VGP with a valid so it's less specific but it's installed there because the other one was discarded so the effect this has is to filter all the invalid prefixes if all the invalid prefixes are filtered the VGP table is clean of invalid prefixes and in this case in these types of attacks I'm mitigating the attack but someone might say that's great well you can see that over there but let us analyze the MTR let me explain something first namely the following there's a question that people always ask what would happen if someone creates a ROA imagine you have validated the RPKI you don't filter anything and you say, well, let's take a step further. Let's start filtering and eliminating all the invalid prefixes. Hasta que alguien... El ROA caduca y se olvida. It expires and is not renewed. So all the prefixes become invalid. Is that an attack? No. So if I use the invalid prefixes, things will work normally. The, the ROAs expired and the ROAs became invalid and the prefixes also became invalid. And I'm eliminating everything. And people say, well, that's the fault of our PKI. So is there any way of filtering? Well, in these cases, you can solve this you can configure these filters in such a way so that that case under normal conditions when you have attacks so that this can be filtered if this is an issue of the ROA and this can be used even though it's invalid and this is like everything there are many ways to do these things now what I thought of some time ago was a a third option in the route map, another match, to match the invalid ones and to set local preference at 50, to lo lower the local preference to 50. So I wouldn't be eliminating the invalid ones. I would be including these in the table, but with lower local preferences would be set at 50. And then we would have to see let me think about this in that case there is an issue of specificity if a more specific prefix is generated this might pose a problem but if someone generates a prefix with the same specificity that i have defined for the ROA, then you will see that the invalid has a local preference set at 50 and the valid one has a local preference set at 200 then it will nevertheless be installed in the routing table the, the one with a higher local preference will be the one that is used because it has a 200 
local preference. Now, in the case in which there is no valid one because all become invalid due to some error, they'll all have a local preference of 50 and none will have a local preference of 200. If I have all at local preference 50 and none with local preference 200, nothing happens. The ones that with local with local preference 50 are the ones that are used. So even if someone makes a mistake and all the prefixes are invalidated, instead of having local preference 200, they'll all have local preference 50. But there will be no more having local preference 200. So the filters work for an attack, and they also work in the event of an error made by the authority. I will stop sharing the slide, and let me see what happened with the MTR if we mitigated the attack. So let's see Colo's screen. So we're going to go to the client screen, refresh the MTR, and what happened? Was it fixed? Did you click on the R? So, so it's all lies. It's all lies. We finished. No. What we see here is MTR in three. So what we want you to pay attention to is that we're going to remove the hijack and from my router, which is 65002. But wait, before removing the hijack, I have a question for everyone. If we said that we're going to mitigate this, why didn't we mitigate it? A microphone. I imagine that we mitigated it after entering it in the routing table. Now the routing table gets um, updated um, automatically. It may take 30 seconds by default. So that was before the coffee break. It should have been solved. So I ask again, why is it that if in the I'm looking at the router and it's valid, the, the attack is mitigated, why do the packets continue to go to the wrong place? It has an explanation. There are no errors. It's just that we are forgetting something very important. The best lesson today of on RPK, maybe because it's the IPv6 is more specific now because it's not uh, in the BGP. Uh, now it was uh, ruled out before, discarded before going to the BGP table. That's not the explanation. So and <laughs> so here we should give you. If somebody does it well it's uh, configured in an interface so it's in the local network now because it's in her router and i'm in a different router that is connected to, through the central router so i am hijacking we put the filters now it, it's it was invalid now it's valid but the mtr continues to be the same what's happening This is a real problem of the network ha that has tortured network uh, administrators for years. And when you uh, notice what it is, you're going to uh, hit your head against the floor because the router that we are using for the BGP session is not b doing the RPKI filter. And I should give you the two, but uh, Sylvia won't like it. But that was excellent, absolutely excellent. So what he just said, don't feel bad about it, because it's too obvious once you know it. But until he says it, almost nobody n realizes what's happening. So what's happening here? What did he say? before we go to the next part of what's happening is that we applied the filter in our router so our router already mitigated the attack but when I 
sent this uh, MTR. The information goes through my router. The router sends it properly because it's been mitigated, but then it goes to the IXP route, central router, and it acts uh, independently. So what does the it do? It, if I don't apply the RPKI also in, in uh, the central router, uh, two, uh, it's not my router that is uh, routing it uh, wrong. It's uh, so this a very important lesson for the RPKI to work. The entire path the attack is going through needs to implement the filters. It's not enough to have just one implementing it. So. To mitigate the MTR, we need to go into the central uh, router and apply the filter there. If I do so, let me do it quickly for you to see. I should uh, stop uh, quit uh, sharing. Because you are the only one that has access. Ya está, ya está. Ahí está bien el router. Acá voy a, lo que voy a hacer es aplicar este, el, el filtro de RPKI en el, en, el, en el router de borde. Para la sesión BGP que está el que está conectando con el, con el router de, de Silvia, del grupo 2, que es esta de acá, Ay, versión 6, un segundo, ah, acá. ¿Y ¿Dónde está? Esta de acá, ¿no? Esto de acá. En vez de permitir la Silva publicar todo, yo voy a aplicar el filtro RPKI acá. RPKI. Listo. Ahí está. Entonces ahora si apretan la R y refrescan. ¿Qué pasó? ¿Se arregló, Colo? ¿Qué pasó ahora? No se arregló todavía. Hay que esperar a que se propague ahí. O debería. ¿No? I didn't apply it there. I have to put no. <sighs> Just wait a second because I didn't configure it. Sí. 
And now, yes. I, I hadn't applied the filter right. So if you press on R, you're refreshing, and there you mitigate uh, the attack because you are applying the filter in both places. Okay. So now let's go to the second part of the tutorial. And we'll see automation. And then we are going to apply that in the router. Now the question is, who uses who uses uh, automation tools? Okay. Does anybody use telemetry instead of using the Ethereum P, most evolved one? with other protocols. Okay, not too many. So, well, I'm going to go very quickly because we have only 40 minutes late. Nico didn't leave much time. So, well, 50 minutes, they are telling me. There. Usually, what we are going to see of automation, it's tools that are configuration managers. They're known as DEP tools or DEP OPS tools that are tools for operators that are rather built for development, but later on they are used to, to administer configurations and we use them in the networks. Usually they allow you to easily deploy automation. And they are partly what is known as continuous delivery and continuous integration. Here we have some tools that are used for automation. Jenkins, uh, Puppet, uh, etc. And there are many more than these. Well, you don't see them. you see it now? Wonderful. So, what I mentioned earlier, the tools, it's a configuration manager, and among those uh, tools, we, here we have among the most, the best known for, uh, to make things e easier, we're going to use Ansible, but you also have Chef, Salt Project, Jenkins, CF Engine, Puppet. These are very uh, commonly, these uh, tools are very commonly used. The other tools uh, are also valid, and now there are even more tools available for configuration of the machines. Let me give you a brief summary. For instance, if we compare three of the ones in the previous slide, they vary in language, in the, in the implementation language. Some use Python, Ruby. In the format of uh, configurations, we are going to see that uh, Ansible uses uh, I am uh, L, and the interesting thing to learn is that although Ansible seems to be very complicated, it's rather simple. And then each tool has its own complexities, but uh, they differ in scope. So you may have, they may be more or less powerful to uh, achieve their goals. Usually, the uh, uh, Ansible um, it is just executed in the main node, and it acts on the nodes that we want to administer. And it uses, uh, uh, the, the, now there are models for Netcom. This diagram of Ansible is developed by Red Hat, That, and uh, then there they have a a uh, tool that is called Tower uh, Ansel is open source, but it is maintained by a group of developers. And now 
In a while, you're going to see that there is a community of Ansible developers. Basically, it's a system where there are some elements that we need to know. Those are the inventory, that is where we see the machines or the hosts or the devices that we want to manage. Then we have the modules. Each module is a piece of code that we'll be able to interpret against which they're going to communicate. And then we have the planning and and the plugins and and then the API and uh, that we you, you can use to change configuration. So the components, what we're going to see today is our Ansible, and you're going to use from the CLI that uh, you run in the RNTR to the router. Those components are three. Okay, va a ser nuestro router, el de control va a ser la CLI. Y and this will also include an inventory. We will only have a device. So the control node, the managed node, and the inventory. This can be used in several devices. So you can declare groups of devices, and each group has a template, and you can apply each configuration. If we would have a MicroTik router and a Cisco router, you can have two groups and then apply to each the relevant configuration or changes that aren't identical. You might even have a third group that could be Juniper. And you can also use this in last mile devices. I'm going to go very rapidly through this. The Ansible artifacts are those things that we have. So these things that you'll now see are the following. You have playbooks, tasks, variables, modules, collections, and templates. This is one part of what Ansible has. So we're going to focus on these in order to start. So the first is a playbook. So the first thing we have is a playbook. This is where everything begins. Here we can declare the main task that we want to execute. After that, we can define variables. We can define inclu includes, which includes other tasks. And the main part is the playbook where we will be working. Then we have the tasks. This is what Ansible will execute. For example, one task would be to install a software package. Another simple one is to create a configuration file. And then there are others that are more complex. For example, deploying an entire infrastructure with a provider. Here we simplified this. We simplified the part of the tasks. On the left side, you have a name that we give to that task. And what follows is what you see over here. This is the module that I'm going to use. So Ansible already has many modules with many commands that we often use, whether for configuration or also for installing. So here we see how you can install a packet in a Linux. We're going to use the APT module, which was used today to install the library. And then we say we, what we want to install from that module. So I'm going to say we're going to install Apache 2. And just in case, we're going to say the state. I'm going to ask for the latest one. So this is this equivalent to doing APT install Apache 2 in any Linux. So with this task, it might seem more complex to look at Ansible's task compared to the command we are used to. And something similar can be done with APT, but varying this, the Ansible modules support the large majority of the options that a command has. has. So the equivalent to this module could be dpkg i and that package, which I brought in a dot deb file or apt install and the package. 
the variables allow me to use these while the task is being executed. So with these variables, I can have dynamic plays, and this will provide greater flexibility. For example, there are two types of variables. Some are known as facts, and others are the magic variables that are inherent to Mansible. With fact, I can check a device and bring the information that is running on that device. That device is a Juniper and has a given OS. And even if it's a server, it's a Linux and it's a Debian 12. So based on that variable, and while I execute the task, I can go to the templates and execute a part that corresponds to Debian or to a router. Modules. As I was saying, we have the official modules, which are those that are maintained by Ansible, and these are the ones that are rapidly corrected. So if there's an error, you do a new version. And then we have the additional modules, which are those provided by the community. So you can develop something in Ansible, you can create it, and you can make it available through the community. So in this case, like all contributions we make, if there is an inconvenience or an error, it takes longer to update that module. I want to dwell too much on the modules, but this is the important part. And in general, <coughs> the main host expands the module and then executes the task at destination. Each device, each type of device, has a large number of modules. These are the ones provided by Cisco. If I have a firewall, I can use Cisco. ASA. If I have an iOS, I use Cisco.iOS. If I have an XOS, I use Cisco.nxOS. This is because the devices, because the configurations are not identical, the commands are not identical for configuration purposes. So each of these modules aims at interacting with that type of devices. <laughs> Galaxy is the site where you can make the contributions of the modules maintained by the community, or you can also download a module and use it. So here you have the site, and generally, when we do an Ansible development, we have to state, we have to create a role, we have to provide a format to what I will be uploading or sharing. Here, for example, you do, they do a search. They're looking for the modules for FRR routing, which is the routing used in the lab. So here you have seven different modules that were provided by different people in order to interact with that device with the FRR. You will see that some are more focused on firewalls. Others are more focused on other things, but in general terms, the contribution of the community is very important. And now we have the templates. This is what I can generate as the task is being executed. So I can modify a template using the variables I obtain, and based on that, I can generate a configuration that I will apply. They use a format called Jinja 2. You might have heard of this. And you will see this afterwards. Everything will be remain online. You can analyze this in detail. You can analyze each of the modules that we'll see now. You will then see that in each of the tasks we implement, we are, well, no. we are generating a template. So what are the first steps in Ansible? First, to install Ansible, I can do this through Python. I have to copy, if I'm going to use this on other machines, I have to copy 
my public key on those machines so that once I connect with Secure Shell, I then am not asked for a password and can directly access the machine executing the command I need to install. In general, I have to use a username that has been authorized to install packets at the router level. Now here we have three very brief slides. One is what the current status is of automation. We have a list of things that I wanted to comment on. In addition to Ansible and in addition to Secure Shell, there are other protocols. So what these other protocols do is that the vendor, the router vendors use these protocols so that we can configure the devices, not no longer in the console, but at the client, then use Ansible and execute changes. So the IETF agreed on the fact that everyone respects just one thing, and which is the data model. If I want to know how to interview a machine, I have to have a data model that is written in Yang. Then we use protocols. Each uses a protocol to connect. Some use NetConf, others use RESTConf, others use GNMI, and different processes. Some use XML to establish the protocol information, others use JSON. So there are variants. And finally, you can use the connection type. You can use Secure Shell, HTTPS, or gRPC, which is Google's RPC. The protocols, then, are the ones I just mentioned. Transport, Secure Shell, HTTPS, TLS, the data model was Yang, the formats. And then there is a trend in the programming languages. You have those who develop these things in C++. Those are the most uh, daring. Then we have Python, Golang, Ruby, and Rust. There are a whole set of languages. Then we have applications. Ansible, the ones we mentioned, these are some. You have others, such as Paramico, NetMico, NetPalm, others, for example, like Bias from Juniper, Napalm. And then we have administrators of these configurations. Many of these you have to pay for. They are developed by the vendors, but there are others that are great and can be used. One is this repo from Cessnet. This is an organization that develops software, the very good quality software. Por ejemplo, ¿qué? And finally, what is Cisco proposing for conducting telemetry? Something similar to what we saw just now. So these are models that develop the language, the model, the transport, protocol, coding the type of protocol that is going to be used for interviewing, NetConf or gRPC. So this is what Cisco offers for telemetry. And you'll see that with telemetry, you also generate a channel. And compared to the traditional case where we interview the equipment with SNMP, and we bring the data, and we do this every x minutes, five minutes, when we create this channel, a stream is then generated. So it's the other way around. It is the device in general that will allow us to capture. It will emit information continuously, and we will be able to collect that information in a collector. So I went very rapidly, but we don't have that much time. So let us now go over to the practice part of the session.
Un segundito. Ah, sí, ahora. Muy bien. Bien. Eh. So we're going to access this URL, https colon slash slash github dot com slash lacnog slash rpki hyphen labs. So are you all there, more or less? So over here, we have all the details of what you have seen and all the things that you can implement from the two laboratories, from the previous one and from this one. And over here, we're going to access the last link, practice guide for automation with Ansible MBGP Q4. So we continue with the same model we had previously, and we'll scroll down until we get to install Ansible collection. So what you will do, because we're going to use the Ansible, the Cisco.ios collections, you're going to execute this command in the CLI, this Ansible Galaxy collection install cisco.ios. I don't do it because I've already installed it. Could everybody enter the guide, Ansible guide, uh, or does anybody need any help? Raise your hands if you could all install the collection. The second step is, is that you need to clone the repository where you have all the playbook, uh, all Ansible playbook uh, tasks. So here, um, execute uh, the uh, uh, command, the git long, uh, and it's going to bring, and the repository is going to bring the repository and all the Ansible components. So the, the third step is to step on in the lab, and so we change the directory there. And now we won't dwell on this uh, too long, but you can uh, execute a tree Ansible and uh, see the components in that repository that we're going to use that is Ansible. Am I going too fast? Are we okay? And there too. Uh, 
All right. So now let's uh, we'll skip this step. And what you're going to do is, we, I don't want it to uh, to spend much time. As you can step. Uh, st stand on the Ansible uh, directory, and we're going to work with that uh, uh, directory. And uh, you, you can do a cut of the playbook d d dot, uh, um, and there you have the playbook with the key tasks. And what you're going to find is the different tasks, the so-called zero task, one, two, three, four, up to nine. All right. Now you need to change the file, the host file. You'll see that it contains an X. So you need to to put replace the X for your group. Does anybody need any help? OK, you're very good students. So for the sake of time, let's go on. So what you'll do now is there is a file that uh, has the variables defined. And you'll see, for instance, the kind of connection that we are going to use, the type of new address uh, that we're going to use, the user, and here it says the password, and it, there are some Xs. There, if you look at uh, the paper you were given today, at the end, you have a password. It's the last column. That's the password you have to enter. So I'm going to give you one more minute to write it down, copy it from the slip of paper. It's not an easy thing. And in that same file, you have to replace the ASN, as you did today, where you have the Xs. And the intensification of the router, the X is always the group. In the ASN, you have to put, if you have a group, uh, a group 8, you have to put 65,008. And if you have group 24, 65,024. Uh, uh, and in the X of the router, you have to put uh, the group. 8, 24, whatever group you have. So I repeat, in this file of variables, you need to replace the password that you were given in the last column. Then you have to replace the autonomous system in numbers with the group, and the same with the my router identifier. Are you ready? Should we go on? 
So let's start. What we're going to do is uh, the diff we s see the different automated tasks, and at the end, we're going to see how far we reach. And there, you can ask, and we'll see how far we can go doing the same thing that we have done so far with an addition uh, with RPKI and RAR. So, the first task that we're going to use is the following, but first of all, we go to the router. And we execute show run. You may see that we have the configuration that we left after doing the RPKI practice. Now we go back to the console. And we are going to execute the first command, that is Ansible playbook minus t0 and we uh, say who the playbook is the, the the file from which i'm starting the task so i'm going to copy this and i execute it and th that is the first task of ansible it's going to leave the router in the situation where we started today. What you're going to see now is the things that change. What is it that uh, it changed? And whenever we execute this task, each task, it will save the previous configuration. That is, here I have several. But this is going to be the first. In this document that is called Backup, you will find a lot of configurations. It's going to ha there's going to be uh, one configuration or two. In one, I, I put the state where it entered. And in the second, the final state. So there you have a way where you can keep uh, the uh, configurations as you change them. And if you make a mistake, you can go back to the previous one. So as we don't have much time, now we'll see what the router is, how the ru router is left, and only the interfaces. And there's nothing left of RPKI or BGP or any roadmaps that we applied later. So far, so good. OK. So what we're going to do is, because of time constraints, we're going to apply several tasks at the same time. So we put T1, T2, T3. T4, T5. This, uh, you keep this. Uh, how how long? How long is is uh, the lab going to be enabled? At least until Wednesday. So, if you have anything pending, you can see it. It's going to be uh, uh, active. Take the piece of paper just in case and. We are going to be there all week, so you can ask us. So uh, what we are going to do with these tasks is the same thing that we did with copy-paste. So Ansible but Ansible is going to do it on its own because they have been declared in the uh, task file. We are going to apply it, and then we are going to see some specific ones. So let's put Enter. And you have each task there. It's going to create uh, the the list, and then the uh, RPKI validator, then the handmade roadmaps. So it's performing each task uh, 
that we saw today when we were developing and configuring the router. So, for instance, let's see task one. In this case, as I said, you declare the module that we are going to use. We, we give it a name. We declare the module that we want to use. And in this case, we use the FRR as if it were a console. So we apply, for instance, the period of time that you did, and then the two validators and the port of each validator, we take them as variables. And in those variables are in the file that you have there. And there, so I have, for instance, RPKI cache one, that's validator one with the IP that ended in point 70 and the other one with point 71. It could be the case that I could have two validators, but one may act on port uh, 323 and another one in another port. I define it there and it creates it. So now what we're going to do is the following. This morning, during the tutorial presented by Eric and Guillermo, you saw a whole set of RPKI concepts and also of RIR. So what we're going to do now is to see how we apply IRR to our router. So first of all, we will verify what objects have been defined in the in LACNIC's IRR, which is the declaration of LACNOG's objects. So let's execute the following command. And for those of you who wish to execute this command, this is who is space minus h, the host I'm going to use is irr.lacnic.net, then something that is not so easy, but it's slash exclamation mark o, which is owner. We already have that fact. We know that the owner is defined in this name over here. So what do we wish to see here? What we're going to see here are the different objects that have been defined. We're going to see, for example, that the route sex object that has one of the addresses with the day to 803 colon 9910 colon colon slash 32 and that slash 32 is in 2 slash 33. So we have 2,803, 10, colon, colon, slash 33. And that slash 33 has been defined into slash 34s. So we have another route 6 object with the address 8,000. This is the one that we saw today. And the one that was Celia hijacked, you recall, was slash 48, more specific. Here we have another slash 34. We're not going to go into the details over here. But here we defined the autonomous system, AS64135. And what I wish to show you is the AS sets. The AS sets that were defined are the ones we created for the lab. One of these AS sets is the one you see over here, AS-lab uh, RPKI permitido one. And the second one I'm going to use is the one that is AS-64135 colon AS-lab RPKI privados tutores. And 
what see, we see over here are the members that you, the member ASs of the that AS set that with which we'll be interacting. So we have 65,000 to 65,000. ES 65,000, which are those of the tutors. If we wish to see this more specifically and knowing the tag that has AS set, we then execute. this command, the who is, and with that name, AS135, lab privados, and the private labs, we have the AS members of that AS set. So what can we do? Once we have that AS set, we will see how we can generate our filters. So let us use a tool that you saw during the lab, which is BGPQ4, and we state what we wish to bring. We want to bring this AS set name. So based on that, we're going to create a list, which is going to be called AS path permit list. So with this information, we generate the filters that we will apply in our router, which has the AS paths. So far, so good. So what we did was the following. We did a query with the IRR to see which are the AS set members. We had that information, and we generated the AS paths that we're going to apply for that ASL. So we're going to l do the following. I'm going to an allow peering. I'm going to accept information from these ASs that have been defined in my AS set. <coughs> so what we did over here, we then automated. Let us now run. Let's see this first so it's clearer. This is task number six. So far, we ran zero that the router did this from zero to five. The router went back to the previous status. We maybe did not check that. We should have put here show run. We trust that the automation does everything for us. So now we can put, I'm going to put show BGP. It should be IPv6. And Nico gave me more routes, but OK, it's OK. And now I have 57 routes. The task we see over here will do that for us. It's going to execute. In a shell, what we just executed, a BGP Q4, it will bring the information. It's going to create the AS paths. But there isn't point here. There's a problem. BGP Q4 does not adequately generate the AS paths for FRR. So here, what we do is a change. We change from IP to an AS, uh, AS path, which is the one that is going to use FRR. So with that aim, we use a regular expression. We replace IP with e BGP. So having done that, we now completed the task. We now have 77, 57 sorry, routes. 57 routes through BGP. So what we're going to do now, we're going to go back to the commands. We're going to execute the T6 task. This will generate the AS paths. So 
So there it finished. We still have all the routes because we still haven't applied this in a route map. Silvia will once again hijack. We're going to go back to the previous case. And you should now see an invalid route. Any questions? So once again, Silvia did the hijacking, and this is the invalid route, which is a slash 48, colon, colon, slash 48. Now we're going to apply task number seven. We're going to filter by IRR. We go back to the router. And because I accept only prefixes or announcements that come from the from sixty thousand through to sixty five thousand, sixty five thousand and five, then the majority of the routes I received were not originated by those systems. Autonomous system. So, what we have here is one single route. And this route is valid because it has 65,002, 65002, which is in the AS set as an AS set member that we used for the purpose of creating these filters. Now, the question. We applied an IRR filter, and this is mostly so that you can see this. I wanted to filter everything that was originated from the that AS set, and this was in fact carried out. And we only have one route that originated in 65,002, and that route is invalid. Now the question is, why is that route invalid, and what is happening here? If we look at the configuration, you already won on, 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 on one. You, you, now let someone else take a, a go, and otherwise you will let you have the floor. So the key point is looking at the router configuration, because we now are used to automating things, and now we have an issue that someone is miss something is missing here. You have to look at the configuration, at the router configuration and see what might be happening here. I just applied a route map we used for filtering, and this route map says some ASN. So if we scroll down or scroll up, I can't remember. It's not there yet. Here it is. So. This is a route map that matches an AS path permit list, and that AS path permit list was built using BGP Q4 and is over here with the filters that we generated. So, so far, so good until that moment. It's complying with this, but why do we get that route?
Can you use the microphone? Otherwise, we cannot hear you. Can our PKI, can you change the roadmap? And now it's filtering by AS. So you have to change the RPKI. But I've put the RPKI filter. I won't be filtering based on the IRR and the ACE path. You're almost there. You have to join the two, the two route maps. You have to join them. But what can I do with that route map? You yeah, had the validation with ASN. Well done, yes. Well done. Exacto. Yes, perfect. Well done. So we now apply a filter, and we no longer filter through RPKI. We applied a filter through AS path, but we forgot about RPKI. So in order to finish, what we're going to do is to go back to our console. And in task eight, we're going to generate, let's see here. We're going to generate this task with, task with this task. Like the winner said, winner number three said, he said you have to add the same route map, the two filters to this route map, so the yes path and the RPKI valid. So what we do in task eight is to generate that route map that you can see over here. And then in the new task, we're going to apply this to the neighbor. So we execute task eight. And we see that the route maps changed. And now we have two matches. So we do it through the two uh, ways. If we go back to the router, and uh, well, nothing is happening yet because we haven't applied it yet. So what we are going to do now is we are going to apply the RPKI roadmap, but uh, now the roadmap already has the two filtering uh, op uh, options. So we apply task nine. That just changes that line in the router. And now we check whether it also filtered it. So as a demo, what we are doing is eliminating through RIR routes that are not announced by our uh, ANSET members. But on the other hand, we are also filtering RPKI. So we have, have to apply the two things, the two technologies. Here it says that I'm three minutes uh, 42 uh, late. Any questions? Well, and as Colo said, you may stay. If this, this last part was very quick, but uh, you can, yes, we'll leave uh, the lab on until the end of the week, so you have all week to configure. Yes, we always leave too, uh, too little time to Colo. Well, but hopefully you've liked it. And if not, well, we are going to be around. 
So if you have any questions on Thursday too, we're going to have a session to clarify any doubts together with Chicho and Erika. So thank you, thank you for staying until the last minute. We want to thank everybody, well, the trainers and all of you for staying so late, and those who are online too. Now, at 6.30, we have the welcome cocktail that is uh, at the Bourbon. So we invite you to the cocktail. You may go with your uh, football t-shirts if you wish. Those of you staying at the hotel, you're going to have transportation back after 9 p.m. You and we'll meet again tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. 13 UTC via Zoom. Tomorrow we have the uh, opening session and several interesting sessions. We have a panel connecting a Mediterranean uh, country and the Laknog and others. So uh, thank you and see you soon.